Lang, good morning. I'm going to speak about the OER Universitas, the most rewarding and meaningful initiative of my career. Note to self, buy a selfie stick. It would be so cool if I could just take a selfie and send home to Wendy and the children that I've performed in the Super Bowl. In the 1980s, the United Nations imposed a cultural sanction, restricting performers to perform in South Africa. It was to raise awareness of South Africans and their journey in dismantling apartheid. Performers were restricted from performing in South Africa, but a few did. And they performed in this venue. And I don't know how to put this uh, tactfully. Most of these performers were past their prime. And I hope you, uh, you uh, I'll excuse you if you, draw, uh, if you draw the parallel between actors that, and performers that are past their prime and this aging distance educator, this aging open educator, as I share with you our journey of the open education resource, Universitas. Let me begin by acknowledging an outstanding pioneer, UNISA. And these are not my words, they are the words of Burje Holumbri, one of the early theorists who started writing up our field. To some internationals, you may not realize that single mode distance education at university level was an African innovation. The rest of the world had to come to Africa to see how it is done. Viva Africa, viva. I'd also like to acknowledge the decade or more that I spent at UNISA, what I know about open distance learning, I learned at UNISA. I'd also like to acknowledge our strong connections with the ICDE community. More than 30% of our members at the OER Foundation are in fact ICDE members. And I'd also like to acknowledge Emeritus Professor Jim Taylor, one of the thought leaders of the OERU, who was in fact your inaugural recipient in 1999 of the ICDE Individual Prize for Excellence. He also served as your president from 2002 to 2005. A little bit about myself, I work for the OER Foundation, which is an independent non-profit entity that provides networking, leadership, and support to education institutions around the world to achieve their strategic objectives through the use of open education approaches. I'd also like to acknowledge Otago Polytechnic. When I was looking for an institution to host the OER Foundation, there was only one institution I could choose, and that was Otago Polytechnic. Otago Polytechnic was the first tertiary education institution in the world to adopt a default Creative Commons attribution intellectual property policy, and which provided an excellent home and foundation for moving the OERU forward. The OERU can, uh, consists of a network of some more than 30 institutions from six regions of the world. I'd like to point out that our strength lies in our diversity. We have single mode distance teaching universities. We have dual mode institutions. We have regional face to face institutions. Our network also includes comprehensive universities which span both vocational education as well as university education. We also have a number of educational agencies like Contact North, Contact North, for example. Ladies and gentlemen, these are the institutions that are leading sustainable education futures. At this point, I usually give my health warning. If you suffer from hypertension, you best listen to me under parental guidance. You see, if during the course of this presentation, I don't get to mention your favorite proprietary software tool, take a deep breath and relax. You will be just fine. 
You see, the deal is if you come to me and say, Wayne, that is a cool piece of software you are using. Can I get a copy? I do not want to be faced with the ethical dilemma of refusing to help a friend in order to uphold the license of the software. Let me begin with a rhetorical question which I attribute to Eben Moglin, the former legal counsel of the Free Software Foundation, proudly borrowed, of course. If we had the technology to be able to duplicate food at no cost, would we charge the hungry more than they can afford? In education, we have the technology to duplicate digital knowledge at no cost. Yet I see the world over significant increases in the cost of tuition. I think the bridge we need to cross is simply this, sharing OER to learn, to learning to share. Carrying on with the performance metaphor, in the free software world, we only have a few rock stars. Richard Stallman, Linus Torvalds, Eric Perens. I seem to sense in education, those that are building open education resources all want to be rock stars. An open source developer worth their salt, the very first thing they will go and do when they are building new software is to go and see what software already exists to reuse, adapt, and modify in building the new. Most educators engaged in open education resources are very quick to share the educational materials, but reticent uh, to reuse what it is already exists. The resonant value proposition of the OERU is simply this. Study world-class courses for free and count them towards real qualifications. Let me introduce you to our first graduate, Michelle Argan. She enrolled for one of our prototype courses developed by the University of Southern Queensland, a course in regional relations in Asia and the Pacific. And in this particular course, the Pacific was defined as all countries that touch the Pacific Ocean. And this is more than 40 different countries. And I'm mentioning this because it would not have been possible to develop a closed textbook that allowed the learners to choose the countries of their choice in achieving the learning outcomes. We developed this course in ways where learners were supported and directed to discover the open education resources relating to the countries of their interest. And this is what Michelle told us. It was also quite freeing not to be tied to a textbook and be able to follow what I wanted to learn, learn about and what I wanted to write about. Michelle was assessed at the University of Southern Queensland. Her credit was recognized towards a credential at Thompson Rivers University in Canada. We have demonstrated that our model works. I would be remiss if I didn't say anything about the M word. However, MOOCs are so passe and so 2012. But I took the liberty of looking at the current terms of reference of Coursera. You agree not to accept credit for completing a, for completing a course unless you have earned a course certificate or other equivalent Coursera credential. We assume this is a Coursera credential for that course. And further on, under the specialization section, if you do not earn your course certificate in, within 180 days, your registration will expire and you will need to pay to re-register for the course. This is hardly open. The majority of materials are based on all rights reserved. You need to register to obtain a password to gain access to the materials and you better be sure that you get this done in 180 days if you don't want to pay more. A little bit about sustainability. In any area that is based on finite resources, a model that presumes perpetual growth is unsustainable in the long term. And this is a mathematical reality. 
many of the strategic plans in higher education that I am aware of are based on an assumption of continued growth. We also know that higher education does not function as a perfect economy. Given the unsatisfied demand, we would expect prices to drop. But in the last decade, in most parts of the industrialized world, we've seen prices increasing for higher education. The other interesting challenge, of course, is the more successful we are in widening access to education, the greater the burden on the state coffers, which means proportionately we will receive less funding over the long term. So how is the OER Foundation doing as a self-sustaining initiative? There are three, three curves there. The red curve is our cost, the green curve, our income, the yellow curve, the revenue we generate from membership fees from our community. We are projecting that by the end of 2017, we will be a self-sustaining, reliant project without, well, without reliance on third-party donor funding. Ladies and gentlemen, we are shifting the question from how do we achieve sustainable OER projects to how will your institutions remain sustainable without OER? A quick reflection on the absurdity of copyright, and this is a real case study in one of the first courses we, would, we developed this regional relations in Asia and the Pacific. In the history section, the catalyst was uh, referred to the seafaring Lapita people who uh, basically navigated through the South Pacific. And we know this because of Lapita shards, uh, pottery which has been carbon dated to some 3,000 years ago. I should point out that copyright didn't exist at that time. It was only enacted in 1709. So there is no way that this artifact had copyright. At any rate, the, 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 the course developer included this image in the course materials. I traced and found out that it was copyright or all rights reserved owned by one of our leading public funded research universities in New Zealand. I wrote to the university requesting permission to release this image that they own under a Creative Commons license. The response I received was an order form for $150 to get a one instance uh, permission to put this on a website. I said, no, 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 that's not what I'm looking for. I'll get one of our photographers from the community to come take a photo and because they own the image, they will release it under an open license. Needless to say, I got no response. The story has a happy ending. I put out an email to our community, the OERU community, and one of our partner members, the University of South Pacific, uh, at the time, Patrick Nunn, who was uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research, in fact led one of the most significant discoveries of Lapita pottery at the Baruba excavations in Fiji. I sent an email to Patrick. I said, hey, Patrick, would you mind sharing a few of your images under an open license? And he said to me, Wayne, I joined this profession to share knowledge. You can have any images you want under an open license. If you ask educators the, what, what, what they think about sharing and licensing, the there is majority agreement that learning materials funded from public money should be released freely for the purposes of education. And we've conducted research with over th with a thousands of educators in our courses, and 95% of educators agree that content funded from taxpayer revenue should be released freely for the use by everyone. Educators furthermore, the vast majority, 81%, agree that it is fair and reasonable for educators to have unrestricted permissions to copy materials for teaching and learning. I'm also very pleased to report on the state of the commons that we have now reached the tipping point, that we have more works licensed under free cultural works approved licenses than the other uh, four creative commons licenses. And free cultural works approved licenses allow for adaptation, modification, and, uh, and modification and commercial activity. This is one of the great challenges we face in open education, is adding the non-commercial restriction. 
which in my view is in contravention of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. I believe that every individual has the right to earn a living. And I don't think we as educators can refuse the right of anyone to earn a living. But there are mechanisms we can protect uh, our open resources by using copyleft. In other words, if anyone adds significant value, there's an obligation, a legal obligation to share back freely. So the core problem we're trying to address, we know conservatively estimated that we need to provide for 100 million additional places at least by 2025. You can do the mental math around that. That's the equivalent of building four sizable universities of 30,000 students each every week for the next decade. You and I know that this is not going to happen. But what if institutions assembled only two courses based entirely on open education resources and they agreed to provide assessment services towards credible credentials? This is what we are doing with the OERU. I should stress that the OERU is first and foremost a philanthropic collaboration. We call it smart philanthropy because the lessons we are learning through the implementation of the OVRU, we are able to plow back into the mainstream operations at our institutions. The concept is simple. We build courses, university level courses, based entirely on OER. That enables us to provide learning, independent study, at no cost to our learners. Through the smart use of technology, we can provide some levels of peer-to-peer -peer learning support and our partner institutions are able to provide summative assessment services on a, uh, a cost, recovery or cost recovery or fee for service basis, leading to credible credentials. It is quite conceivable, conceivable that at some point in the future, governments may begin to fund assessment only models. And if so, we could then get back to a time where higher education could be free for all. Another way of looking at the OERU, under the traditional university package, a student pays for a full package, content services, interaction assessment, credentialing, support, and technology services are provided as a single package. Under the OERU model, open educational resources enable us to provide to disaggregate the services. We provide content services and interaction services at no cost to the learner. The membership, the nominal, nominal membership fees that our partner institutions pay us provides the revenue we need to support the central technology infrastructure and support services that we can provide to the learners at no cost. The assessment and credentialing services are offered by our partner institutions on a cost recovery or fee-for-service basis. If there's one thing that characterizes the OERU, it's the rigor of our planning. We have an extensive context, uh, or uh, an extensive context, input, process, and product evaluation system we are using. We have just completed our input evaluation to assist with design decisions. And from the network, the top four reasons for joining the OERU network are as follows. Widening access to more affordable education in rank order priority. Participating in a recognized OER initiative. Participating in an international network of accredited institutions. Raising international profile. I found it interesting that those items ranked higher then reducing cost and time for course design and development, which we know is perfectly possible with OER approaches, and the opportunity to diversify revenue streams through value-added services. So a little bit about the capacities we are building for sustainable OER futures. And I've decided to stay with capacities. That's not that capabilities aren't important, but I think we've got a long road to travel before we are truly capable in open education. Our, we are building capacities at both organizational and individual level in three main areas. Open governance, open organization, and open planning. 
Open technologies, of course, and open and cooperative design. A little bit about our governance. You will see that the OERU is distinctively open. Apart from the fact that all courses are based on OER, we use open licensing. All our planning, in fact, is conducted openly and transparently in Wiki Educator. Anybody is free to help us shape these futures. All our agendas, all our minutes, all our meetings are recorded openly and transparently in the Wiki. A little bit about the organization structure, which will help you get an idea of how we organize ourselves. We have seven working groups, and currently we have 70 seats serving on these different working groups from our partner institutions. The conveners of each of our working groups serve on the OERU Management Committee, and this is how we coordinate the initiative. And as I said, all our minutes, meetings, and meetings are recorded live in the wiki, so we have an open and transparent record. I think we are one of a handful of institutions that would be able to say that since our inception, we have a detailed, open, and transparent record. The one item that ranked highest in our input evaluation survey related to our open planning methodologies. And what our partners are telling us is that this open planning model builds trust. A little bit about building capacities. Uh, uh, in, uh, a little bit about open technologies, my apologies. We also surveyed our partner institutions in the input evaluation uh, survey. What are the top three recommendations or considerations with regard to technology for the OERU? And this is what they had told us. Our partners want the ability to be able to reuse OERU courses in their local learning management systems. Our partners, the second most rank, highly ranked item, our partners want to build skills in open source development approaches. The third requirement is that of collaborative authoring and version control. Because you can imagine if we are a number of institutions from different parts of the world all collaborating together, version control becomes increasingly important. We wouldn't be able to collaborate in this way in a traditional learning management system because if you gave me access to your learning management system and I came in and I made a change, you would not know about that change. So this is why version control is so important. The way we are doing it in the OERU is we're using a wiki. A wiki is a technology that keeps a detailed history of every edit that is made. It is also designed for collaborative and cooperative authoring. And so what we do is we simply build a collection of individual pages that will be used for the course websites. And we have some smart scripts which run. Uh, you press a button and we will automatically produce a course website, all running on open source technology. These static websites can be incorporated into your local learning management system. We also have options for uh, educators to host their own WordPress installations that use these customized themes. And this is particularly important for many educators in the developing world because many of the IT departments in the developing world do not have su sufficient funds to host the infrastructure needed for online learning. But these days in the cloud, there are open source software services that provide free tier hosting using open source technologies. And we have created the ability for any educator in the world who wants to host their own online materials to do so. Of course, we've spent a lot of time thinking about responsive design because in, ma in many parts of the developing world, uh, access to the internet is of course through mobile devices. The pedagogy that we use is also designed for low bandwidth. The interactions that we use and embed in our courses will not consume much data. 
And this is particularly important for developing parts of the world because we can now load content locally offline and use low bandwidth connectivity for interactions. The third area in which we are building capability uh, is of course in open and cooperative design for OER. In my role as UNESCO and ICDE Chair in OER, we are collaborating with the OER Chair Network in building capability in OER. We have a number of open online courses uh, which build capability and skills in open education. Examples include open content licensing for educators, this particular course, Digital Skills for Collaborative OER Development. And we typically offer these once or twice a year and any educator in the world is free to join us. These courses also carry formal academic credit for anyone who is interested in gaining formal academic credit. And I extend an open invitation to any uh, institutions that want to teach and build capability in open education, either at the undergraduate level or postgraduate level, to take these courses. It is our gift to the education community. Where are we moving in 2016? There's a bit of a chicken and egg kind of scenario. We've been reticent to market ourselves widely until we have minimum viable product. Unlike a number of initiatives in other parts of the world that seem to want to advertise things before they exist. Our priority next year is to complete a free OERU first year of study leading to an exit award. And the partners meeting which we held last week have agreed to this. And we aim to have a first year based entirely on OER with an exit award completed during 2016. The second significant decision we took at the uh, last week's meeting was the approval of our credit transfer and credit accumulation guidelines. You will appreciate the challenges associated with virtual mobility moving across a footprint of 20 different countries. And I'm pleased to report that the partners have approved our credit and transfer guidelines, which we will now implement through, throughout the network. Wrapping up. The OERU does not require new money. The recurrent cost of our partners is recouped. The OERU is low cost, low risk, but high impact innovation. And in the words of Jim Taylor, this is not theoretical speculation. It's entirely viable and we are doing it. And of course I extend an open invitation to any tertiary education institution who wants to join us in helping shape more affordable education futures, especially for those learners who are excluded from the privilege of a tertiary education to come and join us. I thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>